true of keeping a convicted cop killer in prison. Do not let this man out of prison. It's all about Officer Michael Connors. And, and if you guys can see on the screen right there, you see I've got a different picture of him from yesterday. This is the picture of his memorial a picture, his badge, um, talking about a part of America died. That's actually a, uh, uh, that is a plaque I have up on my wall. This same exact police officer's prayer sitting up on my wall right now. So this is about Officer Michael Connors, Oct or November 13th, 1979. Officer Connors was working from the Richmond Bureau of Police where he stopped a car that was occupied by four people that had just robbed a 7-Eleven. Unknown to him, the call had not come out yet for a robbery just occurred. He had no idea of this car. They were just driving down the wrong way on a one-way street. When Officer Connor stopped that vehicle, Vincent Lamont Martin got out, approached the officer, and the officer tried to get him. Officer Connors tried to get him back in his car. He refused. He said, what do you want? What do you want? He pulled out a gun. He shot Officer Connors in the neck. Officer Connors went down, hit the pavement. He went up to him, stood over him. By, and we, we talked about this yesterday uh, with Miles Turner. We talked about all the forensic evidence, the testimony. But just a quick recap. Vincent Lamont Martin stood over Officer Connor while he was laying on the ground, mortally wounded, shot through the neck, which the pathologist said was probably that first shot was fatal in and of itself. Stood over him from a distance of 6 to 12 inches and shot him four more times. One went through the nose, one went here, one here, and one above the ear. The impacts were so difficult, I mean, were so hard that you've got the impact on the side of his face that were shown in the autopsy photos. We're not going to show any of the autopsy photos, but I just wanted to set the stage because the Virginia Parole Board, in their in uninfinite wisdom, has decided that this same guy who one year ago was not eligible for parole and was passed over for parole because he was still a danger to society, was not following the rules of the institution, I mean, we could go on and on. Long story short, this is a guy who a year ago they said is not a candidate for parole. Now, all of a sudden, not only is he a candidate for parole, they're not following their own notifications. They're not, they're not following their own processes. So to talk about this, I have brought in with me Dana Schrod. Dana is the uh, executive director for the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police, along amongst many other associations. Dana, so hey, say hi to everybody. Introduce yourself. Conserve your voice. Yes, good afternoon. Those of you who have talked to me recently know I've been battling laryngitis for about a month. So I have a bit of a Minnie Mouse voice. Um, and so I've had to conserve and not talk a whole lot, which I'm sure a lot of my chiefs and sheriffs are getting a chuckle out of. So <laughs> I'll do my best. Yeah. Well, look, Dana and I go back quite a few years. Um, uh, as you guys know, I'm a former state trooper detective. Uh, you cut me, I bleed blue. Um, this is, uh, and I've got friends who are on the wall. Uh, I've raised money for the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial. This is why I do this. This is so important to me. And when Dana first called me and told me about this case, Dana, I mean, it was like, I, I mean, my first thing was, you got to be effing kidding me. They want to do what? So tell me, how did how did this story? We know we know the backstory. Miles and I talked about the whole case and everything. So now we're talking about. January of 2020. Now we're talking about the parole board meets and they vote super majority four to one. How did you first find out about this case? Well, I give a lot of credit to um, Tom McKnight, who is retired Richmond Police Department. He notified me probably about three weeks ago now, and I notified the executive board of the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police. So at that time, of course, they um, took this very seriously. And it's kind of snowballed since then. We've worked very closely with a number of law enforcement organizations, Virginia Sheriff's Association, the Virginia State Police Association, Virginia FOP, National FOP, a number of groups. And I think this just touches at the core of law enforcement when they hear that someone who very brutally executed a law enforcement officer, I don't care how long ago, is now eligible for parole when a year ago he was deemed not to be. So I think that is that is probably now really at the core of what our interest is. Um, we were somewhat criticized by the parole board chairman for taking up this cause. Um, but as I told our executive board and I've told others, um, it's the responsibility of Virginia law enforcement officers to stand up for each other. We have not only a duty, a right, but a responsibility to speak out when we feel like there's been an injustice 
in a situation involving um, the murder of a law enforcement officer. Well, I know you'll be tactful and you'll be discreet, but I don't have to be because I'm telling you right now how we got from a vote of no parole in January of 2019 to a super... So by the way, folks, in Virginia, when you've been convicted of an offense like this and to get parole, it has to be what they call a super majority. So it can't be a 3-2 decision. It has to be a 4-1 decision. And then here's what I don't understand, Dana. When officers testify in court, unless it's an extreme case where they, they conceal their identity. I've testified in court, I can't tell you new, many times, gang cases, cartel level cases. We had people that were moving you know, thousands of pounds of dope. We worked with the DEA task force. I've testified in federal court. Never once have I been able to shield myself and cloak myself in the anonymity of, well, where did you get this evidence from? Oh, we can't tell you. We got to protect them. So, but the parole board gets to operate in a sense in secret, right? They don't have to disclose who voted and how they voted, nor do they disclose the conversations or the uh, discussions that they had. Is that correct? Well, what's interesting is when you look at the monthly parole board release, when they announce their decisions, when they deny parole, they give a number of reasons why in a particular case. This, the person is violent. The person right. has not served enough time. Um, they've had infractions in prison. They've had any number of things. They list all of that. But when you're granted parole, on the release that's given to the public, it just says you're granted parole. And you don't have an accounting there on that publicly released form as to how the parole board came to their decision. So it's somewhat unique in this case that the former parole board chairman actually issued a statement on the decision in the Vincent Martin case. Uh, that is not normally done. Yeah, let's talk about that statement for a minute, because I want to ask you, you are a recovering lawyer, are you not? Okay, yes. <laughs> okay, you have a law degree, right? You've been around Virginia law enforcement for the long time. In that letter that was written, which I think is one of the most egregious letters and self-serving pieces of uh, uh, less than scintillating oratory I have ever heard in my years, they go on to say, basically say, is um, basically it's not appealable. You can't challenge us on this. And if you had done the due diligence, we had to go back and look at this case and because of the conflicting statements. So I have a question for you. I'm just a little farm boy from Kansas. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. You know, I can't, if you ask me how high I count, I got to have 10 fingers. But when, since when is it the responsibility of the parole board to go back and retry a case that has already had two trials, been to the Virginia Supreme Court, and it is a matter of settled law? I, I'm just, how does that... Where in the where in the Virginia code does it give them the authority to go back and retry a case? You know, it's interesting. The, the code does authorize them to conduct investigations. It's a little unclear to me that the code allows them to go back into a full case review. That is really, I would think, within the purview of the court system. That if this if this individual had an appealable um, issue of law. They could go back to the courts, then that should have been something that, that would have been granted. Yeah, this um, any appeals that have been conducted on this case, any reviews by the just judicial system have never questioned the facts of the case. And the fact is that Vincent Martin murdered Officer Connors, and that I think that's a bottom line. That's that's the that's the bright line for law enforcement is that um, he was issued a sentence of life. And juries, really, I think juries expect that when they issue sentence, that when they recommend sentences or the court recommends a sentence and it's, it's, um, um, it's approved by the, the jury, yeah. um, that what they, what, they, what they think the life is life. And it's one of the reasons that back in the 1990s we actually had the no parole decision made was because um, it was really to ensure that um, if you got sentenced to life in prison, that juries knew you were going to get life. What it resulted in was fewer death penalty convictions. Um, and that's, you know, and so because he had a life sentence and you thought you could depend on that. So I think that that's probably one of the concerns that a lot of people who, who view this case and who view this as being an injustice to Officer Connors see that as being, is that he has not served his sentence in prison yet. Let's let's talk about that for a minute because some people might say, well, this is just an isolated case. This is just a one-off, right? I've talked with you. I've talked with Miles, done mm -hmm. my own research. What we're finding out too, and you actually shared with me a letter that was written by a Commonwealth's attorney 
who actually took the parole board to task. But what we're finding out now, this is not an isolated case. This is happening in other places in the Commonwealth, right? Where we've got murderers, people who've been sentenced to three life sentences plus 59 years, murder for hire. People are being released and there's no victim notification or proper notification to the Commonwealth going on. This isn't just an isolated incident, is this? Well, that's to our, that, that's our understanding. I mean, there's there's a number of them that were released in on, on the March order. I haven't seen the full list from from April, but there's definitely a, a larger number of people being released that are convicted of violent crimes, including murders. And um, I looked back at several of them, and I thought, okay, maybe these are geriatric releases. They're not. They're discretionary paroles. So um, I, you know, and when you look at some of them, if you look at the previous year when they came up for parole. You'll see when they were denied the reasons they were denied. So it it kind of is baffling how in a year some of the folks who have now been paroled that were violent murderers um, have now um, somehow seen the light and been fully reformed in prison. Um, it does bring to task though the other questions that we've had, which is in the middle of a pandemic, how much does that influence a parole board release, um, or is this? I mean, we're we're not really sure what's behind those those decisions because when the when the um, documents are released that say that someone's been paroled, then you you don't really know why. It just says you've been granted parole. So we really would like to know whether or not victims, victims' families were fully notified, the prosecutors were fully notified um, prior to the decision being made, so they can weigh in. We don't know if that's happening in all these cases. Particularly concerned about the violent felons. So I just put up, uh, you can't see it, but the other folks on the screen can kind of see. There is a letter that came in yesterday, um, and I'm going to read a, just a little bit of this and get your reaction to it. So, so this actually came in from the Commonwealth's Attorney Office, Colette Wallace, uh, is it McEachin? Yes. Yeah, and so she she goes through and she talks, she's a brand new Commonwealth's Attorney, and she talks about that you've, you've given uh, this guy uh, discretionary parole. Uh, she's asked the board to reconsider its decision for a variety of reasons. Let's talk about these reasons, right? So one of the things was that she says that it's my understanding that the victim's family wishes to present information. So let's take that first one. Because I know in this self-serving letter from the outgoing chair, the former chair, she basically mentioned, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hide this uh, document right now so we can talk. Um, but I'll make this available if you guys want to see this. But she said, well, we haven't heard from the victim's family for over 40 years. Now, it's interesting because the Commonwealth's attorney basically says 40 years ago, you had no system for notifying victims, right? And the family thought life meant life too, right? Right. I mean, it, it's, it's, to me, it's, it's quite onerous to put it on the victim's family that they have to constantly positively be in, you know, in contact with the parole board to say, now you're keeping him in? You know, you, you need to let us know. Are you still keeping him in? That shouldn't that onus shouldn't be on the family. In fact, there's a you know language in the the code that basically requires the parole board to make a diligent effort um, to contact a victim's family prior to making a, a release decision. So um, I think if you talk to the Connors family, they'll tell you that they don't feel that that happened in this case. Well, and she actually the the Commonwealth's attorney here even talks about it says also illustrates the process the parole board uses to notify victims. For example, when the victim's aged parents received a letter from the board on March 4th, 2020, that was the first time they had been contacted by the board in 40 years. You know why, folks? Because that Officer Connors family thought life meant life. If you're in exactly. prison for the rest of your life and there's no parole, there's no need to contact the parole board because the dude's not getting parole. Yeah, and I, like I said, I don't think the owner should be on the family to have to, to do that. Um I know of a retired Richmond police officer who was uh, attacked. Um, she was lucky to escape with her life. And she has to constantly be vigilant about whether or not the guy who attacked her is going to come up for parole and is going to be released. Now, as a police officer, she has a little bit of understanding, obviously, that, that this happens and that she needs to kind of monitor this particular uh, case because it impacts her personally. But I don't think that the, the regular public who's not involved in the criminal justice system necessarily knows that, nor should they have to know that. Well, and that's, again, that, that's saying what's up. You blame the, blame the victim because they failed to understand your processes, right? So l let me ask you this question instead. What changed from 2019 to 2020? 
Well, that's a good question. Um, the pro I mean, board we, is the same makeup, right? It's basically the same makeup. We have, um, you know, th there's been some changes a little bit, and they're fairly recent. I mean, these are not people who've so served on the board a long time. I think the longest is maybe five years, um, five, six years. Um, but the, um, you know, it could be any number of things. It could be the politics, you know, of, of the day. There's a, um, a lot of concern about prison overcrowding, a lot of concern about minority overrepresentation in prisons. So let's... Let's let's take you know, that. Don't know. Let's take that position right there because a while back the governor came out and said they talked about COVID nineteen and the releasing of prisoners and the and the requirement was you had to be within a year of your release date right and it had to be for a nonviolent felony right 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 so here's the question I asked Miles I'm going to put you on the spot and ask you the same question I've got two people here and you're telling me this is not COVID related so you're giving you're giving this cop killer discretionary parole. So I've got somebody over here for a nonviolent felony. Let's say all they did was sell some weed. And they are 13 months away from being released. So they can't be released because they're not within a year. But yet I'm going to release this guy over here. Whether you want to make room or not, what is the rationale? What is the logic for releasing a convicted cop killer who has been passed over for a parole every single time? Repeatedly, 2019 was passed over for a parole. Has a demonstrated history. By the way, this guy as a juvenile was found, as they say, not innocent in the juvenile system of attempted murder. Uh, armed robbery, another armed robbery with a sawed-off shotgun, was sentenced to prison, was in prison for six years, out on parole for only three months, three days, when he killed Officer Connors. So I fail to understand why this person, COVID or not, should be getting priority over the little weed dealer who's within 13 months of being paroled, but can't get it because he's not within that magic 12 months. It, I mean, I, I don't understand the logic, so help me understand, Dana. Help me, Obi-Wan Kenobi. Know, you. You're my only hope. I don't, I don't know if I can help here, Morgan, because, I mean, it, you know, if they're following the strict letter of the law and someone's not eligible for, for parole at that time, then it may not make any difference as, in terms of, like, their sentence. Um, they're, they, um, you know, they, they take, they're supposed to take a lot of things into consideration. Again, because we don't know a whole lot about what they take into consideration before they approve someone for parole, um, we, we, we don't know really how to interpret their, their process, so to speak. We just know the decisions they make about the people they deny. So if you're going to sort of use the denials as a roadmap, then, and then you look back at the denials from a year ago, then it comes back to the question of what happened in a year that all of a sudden reformed this individual, other individuals, and, and you've now determined that they're eligible for parole. That ought to be something that's documented. That ought to be something that's shared with the victim's family. It ought to be something that they go back to the prosecutor's office. They go back to the law enforcement agency that investigated the crime. And they ought to give them time to, to speak to this as well. Um, I mean, this is not, you don't retry the case at law at, at the parole board. That sh those, are, those cases are tried in the judicial system. So this, this, and this is basically unprecedented because the chair of the parole board issued a four-page statement, um, it basically press release, I'd call it a self-serving press release, basically justifying, and the thing that got me is, well, if anybody had looked at this the way they had, they, that with the amount of time that they had put into this, you know, they would have arrived at the same conclusion because of the inconsistent statements. So, Danny, you've been around a lot of... Uh, law enforcement agencies, a lot of trials. Have you ever seen a trial where every single statement was absolutely consistent from beginning to end? No, it never happens, particularly in criminal trials. I mean, for a variety of reasons, and I'm sure most of your, your listeners who are law enforcement know the things that factor into the inconsistencies that happen at trial. Um, but you still have um, the direct evidence here, which is um, the evidence and, and the corroboration that he committed his to smart His own girlfriend dimed him out. Yep. Yeah. You know, you asked a little bit more about what goes into parole decisions. I mean, the only other thing you can kind of extrapolate, I guess, is looking at the composition of any particular parole board. And as administrations change from right. Democrat to Republican back and forth, you have different appointees. I mean, one of the appointees on the parole board now is a former director of ACLU for Virginia. And so I'm sure that perspective comes to bear in that individual's decisions. I don't want to paint that board member as being someone that's not unbiased when they come, but they certainly have different experience that they bring they to um, serving on the parole yeah. board. They have a different point of view, probably. Um, again, because we don't know the substance of the decisions behind the parole, the people who are paroled, we won't know what, what factored in, and we also don't know how people vote. 
So um, I understand somewhat the reason why, you know, so they can somewhat vote independently. But it certainly means that there's not a lot of information available to the public that helps us understand parole board decisions, yeah. which is why it's all the more important that before they come to a decision, they must make a really diligent effort. They must contact the victim's families, the prosecutors, law enforcement agencies, and give them their time at the table to be able to say, you know what, this is how we feel about this case. This is how it will impact us as victims. Uh, this is how it will impact the law enforcement community and have that all taken into consideration before a final decision is made. And for you folks listening, again, the, the recap, four people robbed this store. They were all arrested at different times, three on the same day. Martin was arrested three days later on a Friday. Nobody had the chance to get together and compare notes and say, let's set up Martin and let's blame him. They all had their confessions. They all made their statements. And then the girlfriend was done independently. So are there inconsistencies in statements? I will tell you, when I was a detective, if I had a statement, if I had three people come to me, which we had on a robbery one time that led into a series of robberies in Georgia and a carjacking and a death and a death penalty case in Georgia I was involved in, if you have stories that line up exactly, that is the red flag. Everybody's right. always consistent, right? Was it red? Was it orange? So, but let's let's take this line of reasoning out a little bit, because what I'm interested in, uh, we'll get into that because I want to talk about the pro world later. What I want to talk about is the uproar and the outcry that this has raised, not only in Virginia, but you've you've reached out to a lot of folks, um, including you've got letters as far away as New Hampshire, you know, and other places. So tell us yeah. about what other people are thinking and saying when they see this kind of nonsense happening here in the Commonwealth. Well, one thing that's very true about the law enforcement profession is the barometer holds true when it comes to someone uh, who is guilty of killing a law enforcement officer. Um, there, there, is, there is unanimity around um, the concern about, about this person serving their time in prison. Um, that there may, he may be a model prisoner. That's not the chief concern of the law enforcement community. Um, I, I can't and you know it, and the folks on you know on this call know it. Um, there is a heart to law enforcement that is different than almost any other profession. You guys will bleed for each other, and um, that's what happened in this case. We lost a brother um, in the Richmond Police Department. Doesn't matter how long ago it happened. Um, I got a call in the middle of the night from one of the officers who was who worked with Officer Connors um, because he couldn't sleep. Um, I've heard consistently from um, members of the Richmond police community uh, um, from now from uh, law enforcement agencies across the country. Um, it doesn't it doesn't matter whether they knew him or not. It, this hits at the core of what it means to be an officer is that you stand together. And and, you know, one thing we've talked about before, I always talk about this when we talk about recruitment. We never had a problem in the past recruiting people to go into law enforcement. They didn't care that the money wasn't good. They didn't right. care that they had to work weekends or storms or that it was dangerous because at the bottom of, of it was that they had the respect of the public. Yep. And I think that one of the things that this communicates back is a lack of respect for law enforcement. And that's when you take that away, you, you really take away, I think, the heart of what draws people to this profession is they need to feel like what they're doing is respected because they put their lives on the line every day. And so I think that's probably why this has really struck a chord um, across the country. The other people I've heard from, though, and this is the heartbreaking part, I've heard from spouses, from widows um, of slain law enforcement officers, and you know what their concern is? Are they going to release the guy who killed my husband or yeah. my wife? And and that's the fear that they have. And, I, you know, I... I it, I can't even articulate what it's like to hear from them and and have them say, you know, thank you for what you're doing, because they have the same fear for what might happen with the person who killed their loved one. I'll tell you, I went to, unfortunately, I think too many cop funerals, and you would go to, you, I don't even know the guy, doesn't matter, we're showing up, we'll drive across state lines, you know, you had officers killed, and you would see people come in from New York, or California, or Louisiana, you know, uh, it just it just doesn't matter. And I think that's the that's the calculus this board has ignored, because I, I have to tell you. In a year, the only thing that can change, I guarantee you, folks, I will bet you dollars to donuts. I will bet you my favorite MacBook Pro that's sitting behind me that I just got. This dude, La Vincent Lamont Martin, did not find Jesus in prison all of a sudden, did not change in the last year. He didn't change. 
the system changed, the people changed, and anytime I see stuff like that, to me that smacks, that reeks of a social agenda that somebody's trying to push through. Tell me I'm wrong. Well, you know, it makes me think of the case of Jeffrey Dahmer, who I'm sure everyone knows that name, and the heinous crimes he committed. He found, you know, he found religion in prison, and, and, and that's wonderful. I'm, that, that was great. Fine. That doesn't negate the fact that he committed crimes, that he had to pay the consequences of those acts. And that's, you know, I mean, I, I can't even articulate it, that it doesn't count with law enforcement that even, I mean, it's great that you rehabilitate yourself in prison, but does that mean now that you're exonerated of, of the need for you to serve out your sentence? You know, this is that age old discussion about whether or not we're about prisons are about rehabilitation or punishment. That pendulum swings back and forth all the time. Somewhere in the middle is the sweet spot about what it's supposed to be. If you're going to spend your life in prison, hopefully you spend it in a productive way. Um, but that doesn't negate the fact that the people on the outside who are the victims of, you, of the crimes you committed are going to hurt forever. Michael Connors served a life sentence when he was killed. He doesn't get and to have Christmas. He doesn't, he doesn't get, get to go to a parole board hearing. Get. Right. So it just, you know, that's, I think that's the part that when you s cease to be sensitive to how this impacts victims, then we have tilted the criminal justice system on its side. And we need to constantly remember that. Um, that victims have a say in this in these matters. Well, and look, guys, you think we're just talking about cops? Let me just point out to you: there was something that just happened in uh, Halifax County, a murder for hire. This person is getting out. Roanoke Times covered a story: somebody who had three life sentences plus fifty nine years, not a cop killer, a murderer, three life sentence plus fifty nine years is getting out. How do you have three life sentences plus fifty nine years and you're getting out? See, this is, this is the part that just makes me want to go insane. Um, you know, because I've been restrained with some of the other stuff I've had to do. I've just decided, no, this is my content. This is, hey, if you guys don't like this, click off the Facebook channel. I don't really care. But I tell you, you have to draw a line at some point. You're smiling. You're laughing. I can't I round up. You know, but I'm telling you, I am tired of politicians, both left and right, it doesn't matter to me, saying self-serving things, doing self-serving things, which at the end of the day, when I first started as a cop, Salina, Kansas, 1982, I was making $7.50 an hour. I didn't do it for the pay, you know? Um, chick stick uniform, maybe I did it for a couple dates. I won't deny that, right? But it wasn't for the pay. As a state trooper, $18,900 a year. As a detective, the most I ever made in one year as a detective with overtime was $29,500. If you folks think we did this kind of stuff, went to the crime scenes we did, got assaulted like we did for the money, it's not. It's a calling. Not everybody can be a sheepdog, right? So when you have a, the old, when you have somebody who is that thin blue line that stands between order and chaos and they give their life, I'm not saying that their murder counts more than somebody else's. I'm saying this murder has a bigger impact on society if it's not dealt with in the way that it should be dealt with, because if this Vincent Lamar Martin has no compunction and is cold-blooded and ice running in his veins, that he can go up and shoot an armed police officer in the neck and then in the face four more times, what do you think he's going to do when he moves into your neighborhood and he doesn't like you and you are two are out in the yard sometime and he's got a gun in his hand? Do you think he's going to follow the rules? He, hasn't ha he doesn't have a history of following the rules. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, the, we've had several recent cases, a couple of them come to mind. One, a gentleman, gentleman, a man who was released from Rikers Island um, who committed an armed robbery within, what, about 24, 48 hours after his release. Oh, Bill um, de Blasio and, was <laughs> shocked that all these criminals being let out are going back to committing crimes. Knocked right. me over with a feather. I'm shocked. Right. And, you know, an a, a inmate who was released in Florida who committed murder within 24 hours of his release. It does call to question, not just in Virginia, but in all states. Everywhere. What is the decision-making process for really determining whether someone should, is not just eligible for parole, but is ready for parole? Yeah. And it, so you have to look at a lot of factors. you got to look at the victims, but you also got to look at whether or not you're releasing somebody um, back into society who knows um, knows how to handle himself, knows how to, uh, how to be a law-abiding citizen. And ironically, as we're releasing people, in some respects due to COVID in the prisons, um, we also are releasing them into um, an environment where we don't have a lot of jobs right now. So without a re-entry plan, a really good re-entry plan that's based on current economic situations, 
you know, we may be setting people up for failure when they when they're released, and that failure results possibly in additional uh, crimes. I know that that our law enforcement community is very much concerned about whether or not we're going to see, with a downturn in the economy, possible more release of uh, um, convicted violent uh, offenders. Whether or not we're going to now see an uptick in tr in crime in the next. Uh, 12, 24, 36 months. Well, this, see, this brings into question, too. If I release somebody in there, we don't have any jobs. There's even a bigger impact because we already know, you know and I know, especially in Virginia, these poor parole officers who don't make a lot of money to begin with that have a huge caseload, you just now have tripled, quadrupled the caseload of something that they were just barely keeping their nose above water to handle in the first place? Right. And a friend of mine who's a federal pro um, probation officer, they're now working with how do we actually supervise folks who are released on probation or parole when we really can't do a lot of close contact. So You can't go into their homes and search. You know, it's kind of like their homes are almost off limits. I can't do the knock-knock. By the way, when you're on parole or probation, you give up a lot of rights. And one of those is that as a parole officer, probation officer, I can come in at any time, search your house. I can, you know, you can you uh, take a UA, urinalysis, you know, take a drug screen, whatever else. This right. is your conditions of parole, right? And now, how do we enforce that stuff? So let me ask you this. Taking that, right, now that you guys have looked at this, what are some of the things that law enforcement in Virginia, especially you with the Virginia Chiefs, what are some of the fixes, legislative fixes? You And, and I know that you've talked to senators and other legislators, yeah. right, and there's some people getting behind this. So let's talk about now, what, what do we do now to solve this problem? Martin is over here. We're going to keep working this thing until our last breath. I, I don't care if he gets out. I guarantee you with one of the cases Miles and I talked about yesterday, they go back and refile this case. This dude's going back to prison. Hopefully he just won't get let out again. But but what are what are the things we need now to start doing long term to fix this legislatively? I think there needs to be more sunlight, more transparency in these decisions, more accountability. How can you be put in a position to say, you can't hold me accountable, you can't know which way I voted, and we don't even have to tell you? And by the way, our our decisions are final. They're not appealable. What I mean, have we just coordinated and we just crowned somebody as king of the world? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, you know, I used to be a staff attorney for the State Crime Commission. I've done policy work in the criminal justice arena for 35 years at least. And it's, I think that, you know, we, we always tweak systems, whether we tweak parole or law enforcement or prosecution, whatever, we tweak it. And it usually happens when we have something egregious come to our attention. And then we, it, it shines a light on something that, that um, maybe needs to be uh, reevaluated. The problem that I think we have in any society is we're all busy people. And when someone comes up for parole, when the, the, the whole actions of the parole board, if they're not constantly scrutinized, if they're not held to a high level of um, accountability and transparency, and also pos positive requirements to report out to the public, then what we don't know, we don't know. So we don't know necessarily, unless you hear from people who are directly impacted, when people have been released that um, create a great concern for public safety, or when people who are released um, offend again, and they were released because they weren't given enough due scrutiny before they were released. I mean, it, it does, it kind of implies that we as the public have to do due diligence all the time. I don't think we should have to do diligence all the time. There needs to be controls built into every government system so that they are self-evaluating, so that there are avenues where they have to report out what they're doing on a regular basis. So I think that the concern here is, you know, how is the parole board reaching their decisions? We need to more, need to know more about the ones they, uh, when they do grant parole, why they made those decisions. We need to know more about how victims can be notified by yeah. the parole board far enough in advance for them to, to work with the system. Look, this is not something that people have a lot of expertise in. So the parole board should not expect the general public and victims particularly to be standing at an even level with them uh, when they don't know how the system works. They need to actually extend assistance to victims to be able to participate in the system. They need to make sure that they're contacting Commonwealth attorneys. Our Commonwealth attorneys are, are heavily burdened with the current cases of the day. They can't be constantly checking on who's up for parole that they may have, that may, yeah. they may have, have, have had sentenced. So it's, it, I think it does put uh, it encumbers any um, public body that has such a critical mission, which is to determine whether or not someone is released who has committed a crime against the Commonwealth. Uh, it puts it puts a big uh, burden on that that agency to be more out 
forthcoming, to be more proactive in how they address the public. So I think that that's something that um, in reviewing how they do business, that's something that I think um, we have some senators uh, that are very interested in pursuing that. And we may see some legislation in that arena. So real quick, we had a couple of folks pop up. Gary Kunstler, a buddy of mine, a former cop, uh, instructor now to a criminal justice program. He asked a question too, was the sentence for life in prison or was it a death penalty? So Gary, the first in the first trial, he was convicted in less than, in about 12 hours. They went to the death penalty phase. It was found to be a capital murder. He was given the death sentence. In Virginia, as in most states, it's an automatic appeal to the Virginia Supreme Court. What happened in that first case was one, and it wasn't even a juror. It was what they call a veneerman, as I learned from Miles yesterday, but they were part of the jury pool. One person that the defense said should have, out of 13 uh, assertions of, uh, of, of, of that they say were materially wrong, these 13 assertions, uh, only one that the court said was there an issue with, and they said the, she should have been dismissed as opposed to the defense using a preemptory challenge, their own strike. For one thing, she never even heard a piece of evidence. This case was referred back. Second trial happened again, same prosecutor, second trial, got convicted, and this time he got a life sentence. And I, we kind of figured out yesterday, talking to Miles, part of that was... Um, you, you're leveraged the first time with the other defendants they haven't been sentenced yet. So if they lie, you know, they get the full sentence. They all were sentenced to 30 years, 10 years suspended for their cooperation in the trial. So And then and then that's how we got there. Colin Berg, another buddy of mine, uh, Rangers lead the way, uh, Philly uh, Sergeant, uh, Philadelphia Police. You talk about people that were releasing people left and right and what those guys are dealing with. So Colin, and I should actually catch you guys up. I should do like they do on TV. So we're talking with Dana Schrod. Dana is the executive director of the Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police represents all the, the police departments, you know, in, in the state or in the Commonwealth. And what happened was is Dana has been leading the charge within Virginia to coalesce these agencies around to get this letter writing campaign going to contact those legislators to find out what's going on. And so what we're doing is, yeah, recapping, same case, um, but a different perspective now. Now we're talking about what is law enforcement doing in Virginia to address this problem? What kind of legislative fixes are we working on? So let me ask you, if you were queen for a day, and you can make any rule you want. What 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 should the policy be when it comes to parole? What what should it look like? What should I what should I as a victim of crime be able to expect from this parole board other than meeting in the middle of the night under the darkness of night, coming to a decision that nobody has to be accountable for, and releasing a effing convicted cop killer back into the public? Oh, by the way, I, I have a challenge. I call it the cop killer challenge. If you think this is such a good idea, I'd like to have this guy move to wherever one of the parole board members in and move in next door. Anyway, let's talk about your queen for a day. What kind of fixes would you provide? You know, I can't, um, I can't say specifically um, because I would really have to kind of immerse myself in the parole board policies and their procedures manual, both of which are on their website, and see where I think there might be either a gap and how they they should be accountable to the public, or because it may not be that there's a gap in what their current the current law is or the current uh, policy manual is, the gap may be in how they're carrying out their duties and whether or not they're actually applying everything that they're supposed to be doing in their policy and procedures manual and in the law. So, and that of course is something that it's kind of like a management audit. They ought to be um, you know subject to a management type audit every so many years just so we can make sure that they're steering the ship right. Yeah, that's, and, uh, that's interesting. I mean, you know, you think about other places. Uh, VACP is a nonprofit. You guys, if you know companies that want to work with VACP, you guys should definitely support them. But you guys have to go through audits. We have to turn in. I have to go through, you know, I have to turn in my books to my accountant. You know, a lot of people go through audits. They have to just, why don't we have, it, it seems to me that the parole is one of these systems they want accountability for the prisoners, but yet we don't have the same level of accountability for the people who are determining who gets out and who stays in. Yeah, we do have systems in place to do that, obviously. We have an inspector general's office. The problem is it's a passive process. I think that there's not something that automatically where they come up for review. It's a matter of, it's usually someone has to lodge a complaint that generates some kind of an inspection or some kind of investigation. Um, so I think the fact that it's somewhat passive, and frankly, the general public, when you when a parole board says, well, they didn't contact us, frankly, shame on them for saying that, because it should really be, the onus should be on the agency that, that holds the keys to the prison cell yep. and not in the hands of the, of, the, um, of the victim's family to make those inquiries. So I think that, that um, 
to that degree, I would like to see that, that burden shifted somewhere in the policies and procedures to make sure that they are doing everything they can to invite participation in the parole board decision-making process. I'll tell you, one way to solve this problem very quickly is to say, if you don't follow your own policies and procedures, if you don't give the proper victim notification, you are criminally liable for any acts or crimes committed by the person that you violated your own policies to release. You want to see change happen very quickly? It's when you impose the same laws on them that you require other people to live under. Now, that's just me talking, you know. I'm just, I'm probably just a little bit, uh, somebody's going to say I'm radical, but I'm not radical. It's just, I think there has to be some legislative fixes and it can't just be, I know you talked about earlier, we tweak here. This is, this is far beyond a tweak. This is bringing the car in and doing a freaking overhaul of the thing that drives this car. It's a, this is a major overhaul. And I, my concern is whether or not this current administration has the uh, political cojones to actually do that. Because I haven't heard, I've heard that they said that they were going to do it. Don't tell me that, and actually Miles pointed out, no decision is final. So now we have a new chair, right? If I think I understand, there's a new chair that just started. Right. So they, this could, and this was brought up yesterday, and I thought it was a very spot on uh, observation and potential strategy. Could this new chair revisit this decision and come and, re and bring this back up for consideration? Well, it appears, and, and, uh, Colette McEachin, the Commonwealth Attorney for Richmond, points us out in her letter that they do have an avenue to reconsider and rescind this decision. So it appears that, yeah, that, that is there. Unfortunately, it takes the lifting of all the law enforcement family in Virginia and other states to actually get them um, to possibly consider that. We don't, I mean, the fact that the Commonwealth Attorney wrote this letter doesn't necessarily mean that they're going to follow through and, and, and do a reexamination of this case. Um, it just, you know, but it's, it does bring great weight to it. And we're very appreciative of her request because she does have standing as the prosecuting attorney in the jurisdiction where this crime originally occurred uh, to make this request. Another interesting tidbit too about the new chair, right? And I'm not, I, you know, everything's public information. It's public record now, sure. right? Let's talk about the background of the new chair, which might give us a little bit of hope. What was her former role? She's uh, been, a, been a police chief here in Virginia. She's been on the command staff, actually in the Richmond Police Department. Um, and she started her law enforcement career in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, she's a very um, astute, I think, uh, law enforcement professional. Um, and she'll bring a different, um, I think, uh, perspective to the parole process. And, you know, let's face it, it's five human beings making these decisions. They're not automatons. And so you have to consider that all of them bring their personal experience, their expertise, you know, their, their um, education to this process. And so when you bring now someone in who has a law enforcement background, how will she then, um, what weight will she carry on the parole board in their decision-making process? And will she bring that law enforcement background with her to the process? Well, I certainly hope so. And, and nobody would feel it more so than her because that would, like when I first started on Salina PD in 1982, we had just lost an officer three years before, Jerry Ivey. I remember that case. I remember reading the case file. Um, it was one of the things they wanted you to do to understand the sacrifice that folks made. And, and I've never forgotten that. I've never forgotten the people, the funerals I've went to. So uh, I don't think that this new chair, that she'll forget it either. But I still go back to, here's the thing that still pisses me off in a major way. How do you go from 2019 no parole to 2020 parole? Uh, this, right. this, is, this is the question. This is the crux. This, if you can answer this question, you answer everything about either what's broken or what should have been caught. Uh, there's, you can't, there's no way you can tell me that there was, oh, we didn't see. The, for, the, for the outgoing chair to write this four-page letter basically justifying everything they did to say they've done this independent and thorough review. And, and, and if you folks out there were as good as us and had done the review we had, you, you well, look, I read, the, I read the case, I read the, the trial transcript over the weekend, 906 pages. I think I know more about this case than they do at this point when you start looking at the first suspect was arrested at 6.20 in the morning. The second suspect was arrested at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. The third suspect was arrested at 8.30 at night. They actually walked in. The fourth suspect, Martin, was arrested uh, three days later. You tell me when they had the chance to get together. So it doesn't matter if Falk or uh, Neblet said, I was at the door. No, I was at the door. No, I was like, who cares? Yeah. The issue of fact was 
there was it was very clear who shot Officer Michael Connors, and it was Vincent Lamont Martin. One time to the throat, four times to the face. I mean, those facts are clear. You know, it just seems, to, and this is just my personal opinion, it seems to me that the role of the parole board ought to be looking at time served, infractions in prison, um, you know, the role of that individual. If, if the decision behind Martin's release was based solely on this is what we've observed, he has not had infractions, which we know is not true, we, he is, you know, that he's been the perfect model prisoner since this crime occurred, and that's our reason for releasing him, we would have less of a concern. But when you start going in and questioning the court's process, the court's decision, and you start second-guessing based on your investigation, which, by the way, didn't involve the police department, didn't involve the Commonwealth attorney, didn't involve the victim's family, to come to a conclusion that you believe that this person might have actually been innocent, um, that goes far beyond, in my opinion, the purview of what the parole board decision process should be. Um, they are not a, a, a court of law, um, and, and their decision should be based on what was, is within their purview. In other words, stay in your lane. So, well, look, if you want to retry the case, then the defendant should have introduced evidence to get to uh, bring to a court, which their defense attorneys tried to do, to get it. Right. They got their new trial. They got the second bite at the apple, and he got convicted again, just the same way he did with the first time, with the same evidence, the same witnesses. And I think, like Miles did, Miles just said, great job, Morgan. He actually meant Dana. Dana's the one doing the great job, Miles. You are failing in your fan appreciation here. Um, yeah. I mean, it goes back to the facts of the case didn't change. The facts are everybody testified. It was Vincent Lamont Martin. Um, everybody, and I think that's the reason, and Miles brought it out yesterday, probably why he got a life sentence the second time around is they're just, they didn't really give the same testimony they did the first time, you know, because there wasn't as much at stake and they, they knew they knew what was there. So it's okay. Do I prefer he would have uh, been given the needle and stuff? Absolutely. You know, I, I I mean, I think it's, I, and I don't know if it was the needle back then or... Um, the chair. Yeah, yeah, the chair. Yeah. yeah but, but, you yeah. know, but but Dana, this bring, actually brings up an interesting point. We talked about this. Let's, um, hey, Jody, um, let's talk about this, too, because the death penalty was declared unconstitutional. I think it was 1972. Virginia tried introducing it, I think, two more times. It was declared unconstitutional. But the third time, when they had the two criteria that said it must either be A or B, you know, this thing held... And so, you know, would I be okay that he got a life sentence? No, not really. But if he got a life sentence, that's fine, as long as it meant a life sentence. So mm -hmm. I think I think the real concern here is, like you said, it's does what what does a life sentence mean anymore? Why is he eligible for parole? And what can we do? I mean, if you were talking to, I know you've talked to law enforcement. If there is a citizen listening, what kind of things can citizens do to say, let's register our discontent, let's let our voice be known? What kind of things can they do? Well, uh, first, you know, case in point is they can um, they can send letters to the parole board, and we have information that you've made available. It's on our Facebook page. It's on our website. Uh, but you can just go to the Virginia Parole Board website, and there's a, a place where you can file a letter. There's an email address. My understanding is they've got a couple people actually working on the um, the influx of, of letters and phone calls they've gotten on this case. So this has definitely struck a nerve in Virginia. Um, but that's that is the process right now. Um, there are there have been some other folks that have tried to um, initiate a request to the um, to the inspector general's office to see if they can initiate an investigation. I don't know how where that uh, where that will go. But the other place they can go is to their legislators and and particularly those who have a story to tell. Because if you have a personal story to tell, if you've been a crime victim or lost a member of your family and you've had um, the perpetrator released prematurely in your mind, or if you've yep. had you've known of the person to, to be released and commit additional crimes, register those concerns with your legislators. Our state legislators are very interested in hearing from their constituents, and particularly when you have that personal story to tell. Like I said, I've already heard from widows of slain law enforcement officers who are very much concerned about what this says for the future of other people who might be serving time in, in prison for capital murder of a law enforcement officer. That, in our mind, is the most egregious offense um, when you kill a public servant in cold blood. And um, it's just, it's something that, you know, if, if you're not going to be executed, if we're not going to actually have a death penalty, then life in prison for capital murder ought to be something that sticks. Yeah. Well, look, let's close out here, because I, I think what we've done is, um, 
I mean, uh, so yesterday when Miles and I talked, we went through the case, you know, f a soup yeah. to nuts, right? Now we've looked at what um, has, has been happening to keep this guy in prison. So let me ask you, um, if you know, I think they said they deferred it until May 11th, right? So what are the next steps? What are some of these key dates that are coming up that we need to be aware of? Well, we really don't know what the parole board's going to do. All we can do right now is send our input into the parole board and say, please, you know, reconsider, resend this decision. The letter that the, the Chiefs Association sent basically said, can you delay this for a year? Because we want to see what this process looks like. And because we were hoping that there might be a legislative review of the parole process uh, in the meantime to reexamine this. I mean, parole has constantly been looked at over and over the, in the years and and. You know, it gets reformed in different directions depending on who, who's in charge basically politically in the state. So we, we know that there's going to be pendulum shifts from time to time. Um, so I think that right now what we're hoping is that between now and May 11th or on May 11th, the parole board announces that they're rescinding the decision or they're delaying the decision for some period of time to re-examine it. And that's the most we can hope for right now. Um, if it doesn't happen in the Martin case, we need to be vigilant about these other cases to make sure that we protect the interest of not only our prosecutors and our law enforcement officers who work on these uh, murder cases, but, uh, but most particularly on the victims and how they are impacted by the early release of a convicted felon. Well, you know, Dana, I'm going to ask you a final question here because you've seen a lot of things happen in your career as the executive director. You've been a lot of things. On a scale of 1 to 10, 1 being doesn't register at all, 10 being this is the biggest bunch of BS you've ever seen. And those are my words, right? But use the same scale, right? Where does this thing register in terms of, of all the things that you've seen? Well, what I'll do is I'll use the barometer of the people that I work for, which is law enforcement. I have never seen, in my time working for them, and I've been here more than 25 years, I have never seen a particular issue raise more concern, raise more passion, raise more ang sadness, if nothing else, anger among the law enforcement community than this particular case. So, um, yeah, it hits pretty close to home. Yeah. Well, you folks that are listening out there and that you might be hearing this on a replay uh, to, you know, to the tens of ones of thousands of millions of listeners we may have at some point, right? Uh, go to the v VACP, Virginia Association of Chiefs of Police uh, Facebook page. It's on there. The web Is it on the website or just the Facebook page? It's on our website. We have a news blog on our website. You can find the release there that, that talks about the ways you can contact the parole board. I want to also... Give a shout out to the uh, Richmond United for Law Enforcement. Uh, the folks at Richmond United for Law Enforcement, which is a lot of retired officers, but also people interested in supporting uh, law enforcement officers in the Richmond area, they have been very active on this as well. And they have a Facebook page with a lot of information on it. So that's Richmond's United, Richmond United for Law Enforcement is, a, is another great resource. And uh, my thanks to them for everything they're doing. Well, I can guarantee you between the segment with Miles yesterday, the segment with you today, we've done more of a fair and unbiased review of the facts of the case uh, than I think the parole board did. And it all boils down to the same decision, right? I mean, am I biased? Absolutely. But I think at the end of the day, you look, you go where the facts take you, especially as an investigator. Where do the facts take you? The facts are incontrovertible. The facts were not in doubt at all on this case. And then I'm going to leave you guys. The, no, the, and, and Miles actually brought up a good point. This, this guy, this Martin, filed 12 habeas petitions while he was in prison. He, he still didn't get out because of that. Folks, th this was settled. Th this was... If there was thing like overwhelming, now did they find the weapon? No, but they had eyewitness testimony from the victim who was robbed in the 7-Eleven. Begin with said three people: one with a blue revolver, one with a silver revolver, one with a shotgun. Guess what those or a rifle? Guess what those guys were armed with? Those exact same weapons. Everything fits. Everything falls into a place, and the dude's own girlfriend gives him up eventually to law enforcement to say this is what he told me he had information only the person who committed the crime would know so if this doesn't get you guys spun up to say we've got to take action then you need to send me your name and address and i will send paramedics over to your house to check to see if you still have a pulse of any kind and then eeg brainwave activity hey, and morgan on that point i think one thing that we need we need to not forget officer connor's uh sidearm never left its holster was still snapped this into was his holster. not a gunfight this no. was a murder and, you, and and if even if it was, you don't get the chance to shoot at the police anyway, you know, right? And but that that's a point Miles made yesterday. He had gotten out of his car. It was so sudden, and come on, he didn't have his hat on, which normally was that was the the norm for the Richmond police. When I was a trooper, you didn't get out of your car with a hat, right? So your cover. So 
folks, I mean, the, the fact that this thing, if there's one case that screams out that we got to do something about this, I had, we were launching this channel and I was going to wait, but when this case came along, when Dana told me, when you told me about this, I said, I don't care. It's not going to be fancy right now. It's just going to be a bunch of talking. I'll try and put some little bit of production value. I don't care. This is a story that's got to get out, whether five people hear it, 50 people hear it, 100 people hear it, somebody better hear it. And if we all keep repeating it loud enough, long enough, somebody in Richmond is going to hear this. And I, But I will tell you this, and you politicians out there, if any of you have the guts to watch this, um, and you have the guts to actually take action, there is an election coming up. Uh, people will remember names. There will be accountability, and either you're on the side of law and order and justice, and it doesn't. This is irrespective of color, creed, sexual, gender, politics, whatever else. Either you believe in a safe and orderly society, or you don't. You know, there there is there is no in between. And Dana, we, you and I have never discussed politics about the way you vote or the way I vote because it's that, folks. It's immaterial how we vote. All that matters is if you wear a badge. If you've taken the oath of office, if you die in the line of duty, you need to know that there will be people like Dana out there, like Miles out there, like Rule out there, other people that will never forget you. And we will stick with this until this case, until we get justice for Officer Michael Connors. By the way, into watch uh, November 13th, 1979. That's when he paid the ultimate price that Vincent Martin didn't have to pay because he skated out of a, uh, a death sentence. So anyway... You get the final word. I'm going to let you have the final words. Anything you want to wrap up with? Shout outs, uh, actions. What would you like to say? Yes, there's strength in numbers. We need your letters going to the parole board. We need your phone calls, letters going to your legislators. Um, let them know how this impacts you, and uh, we'll see if we can make some change. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, guys. So, hey, until next. And so what we're working on, we're trying to get some more people to talk about this. We will. This will not go away. And the other thing I'm about to launch still on the same channel, I'm going to talk about, and it's been inspired by Dana and the other folks. I'm calling it the COVID Chronicles. I'm going to start chronic, chronicling all of the crimes that are being committed by people being released, quote, because of COVID. We're going to find out what's more dangerous, the disease or the criminals. And I think I already know my answer. So anyway, Dana, thank you very much. We'll stay in touch. Guys, we're working on something pretty cool. When it comes to fruition, we'll be good to let you know. But if you folks out there know some good corporate partners for the VACP, send them their way. This is an organization that needs your support, that needs our support, so that they can do important things like this. Okay? So, Dana, you hold on the line. I'm going to stop the broadcast. Everybody, stay safe, sanitize, six feet away from each other. This, too, shall pass. Salute. Thank you.